Have you all heard of Victory Gardens? Victory Gardens were fruit and vegetable gardens planted on public and private lands during World War I and World War II. And while these gardens disappeared after the fighting stopped, the importance of Victory Gardens remains. Gardens are important tools in the present day fight against such enemies as the obesity epidemic, food insecurity, and environmental degradation. Plus, there were few things as satisfying as eating something you grew. So, as this wartime propaganda poster says, sow the seeds of victory, plant and raise your own vegetables. Hello everybody, my name is Tyler Lloyd and I grew up gardening. But since leaving home after graduating high school, I haven't done a whole lot. That changes this year because we now have a plot at our community garden. It's only three by nine feet, but you can grow a lot of food in a small space. As I've been planning and preparing what to grow, I've been thinking a lot about gardening, which eventually led me to the topic of victory gardens. I thought that they were a thing of the past, but I was pleasantly surprised. Let's start with some very fascinating history about victory gardens. What can we do to help win the war with food? During World War I, Wilson described gardening as just as real and patriotic an effort as the building of ships or the firing of cannon. To support the war garden effort, the United States government started a program known as the School Garden Army. Funding came from the War Department and the whole program was run through the Bureau of Education. Now, the whole idea of this program was that eventually after World War I, that people would know how to garden to prevent food insecurity. Wouldn't it be great if the present day Department of Education or Department of Defense still funded school gardening programs? Or if governments considered gardening to be a form of patriotism? We can grow food for victory in our own backyards and even in vacant lots where perhaps only weeds flourished before. The head of the National War Garden Commission, Charles Lathrop Pack, coined the term Victory Garden as World War I was nearing its end. More upbeat than War Garden, the term was so popular that it was used again during World War II when Victory Gardens sprang into action once more. In 1943, with World War II underway, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt had a Victory Garden planted on the front lawn of the White House just one of the millions of Victory Gardens planted that year. War propaganda in seed catalogs showed women and children tending Victory Gardens and framed gardening as a form of patriotism. And scores of seed and nursery houses can supply us with other vital gardening information. Then each spring, we can start our gardens with good seeds, plant them in rich, well-tilled soil, Prior to the war, many had never harvested crops, but by May 1943, there were 18 million Victory Gardens in the United States, 12 million in cities and 6 million on farms. And these Victory Gardens supplied 40% of the produce in America. Once the war was over, however, lawns and community commons returned to being grass and ornamental plants. Home vegetable gardens, of course, didn't completely disappear, but they weren't as prominent. That was until about the early 2000s, when it seemed that interest in local food really started to grow, pun intended. In 2006, Michael Pollan's book, Omnivore's Dilemma, was released, which gave a fresh take on the impacts that food has, um, the ethical and environmental concerns that go into thinking about what we eat. And in 2007, Barbara Kingsolver published Animal Vegetable Miracle, which chronicled her family's attempt to eat only local food for an entire year. Uh, an excellent book, which I have lots of notes on. And then in 2008, the documentary Food Inc. came out, which further sort of raised awareness about food, where it comes from, and the impacts that it may have. So I name all these three, um, you know, sources of, of nonfiction around food because they were very emblematic of the, the thinking of the time and the raising of awareness around food issues. In 2009, the White House planted its first garden since World War II. And apparently in 2013, 
one third of all Americans said that they grew at least some of their food. Then the pandemic happened and people really started to garden. One in part to have something to do while stuck at home and also because they were seeing how food supply chains were breaking down, going to grocery stores and seeing empty shelves. So they wanted to take matters into their own hand and grow a little food themselves. Do you grow any of your own food? I would love to know in a comment down below. But you don't need a large amount of space to you know, grow things. I've got these microgreens that I'm growing right in front of my window. But growing food is a nice way to practice self-sufficiency, to learn about where your food is coming from, uh, to be a little bit more environmentally conscious, and also, again, just a fun thing to do. We're currently facing a whole lot of problems as, you know, humanity. And I'm not going to say that gardening is the key to fixing all that ails us, but it can help alleviate some things. Gardening can help win the war on obesity, particularly childhood obesity. If you want children to eat kale, have them grow it, raise it, see the, how it matures out in, you know, in nature, and then empower them to bring it into the kitchen and learn how to cook for themselves. Gardening can also help alleviate food insecurity. 23 and a half million Americans live in areas known as food deserts, and half of those people are low income families. Now, gardening activists like Ron Finley are helping change these neighborhoods by turning food deserts into food sanctuaries. As you can tell, I'm very excited about gardening right now, and it's something that I'm going to be doing in my own personal life, so I'm gonna be documenting it and making more videos around gardening, agriculture, sustainability, and local food. So if that interests you, be sure to subscribe down below. If you wanna hang out for a little bit longer, maybe check out one of these videos that uh, YouTube thinks you'll like. But until next time, my name is Tyler Lloyd, and I wish you the very best. Later.